Dive into God's Word. Dig a little deeper. Discover the Bible's message for you today. Pathway to Paradise Ministries presents Deeper, your daily Bible study with Dr. Tim Rumsey and Pastor David Salazar. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, at least it's morning here, but I uh, realize it may be a different time of day where you are at. Uh, that's part of the uh, beauty of uh, having a worldwide Bible study like this. So wherever you are or whatever time it is, thank you for joining us today. And we are going to look at the first part of Daniel chapter 7, where he sees these four great beasts come up out of the sea. Before we uh, begin our study, let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, We thank you for the opportunity today to study your word together, and as we look at the beginning of this amazing prophecy in Daniel chapter 7, we pray for understanding, we pray for wisdom that only comes from your Holy Spirit as you take these things in your word and open them to our minds, and even more importantly, to our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Daniel's vision of the four animals emerging from the sea is highly symbolic, and it ranks as one of the most amazing prophecies in the Bible. The level of detail contained in this vision and the sweeping panorama of history that it provides is truly astonishing. When compared with the vision of the statue in Daniel 2, the meaning of its strange symbols will become clear, and uh, we will, of course, go over that in our study today. Let's start by reading the first couple of verses here in Daniel chapter 7, beginning with uh, verse number 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Now, uh, just a couple of points to note here. This is in the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, who, of course, is the final king of Babylon in Daniel chapter 5, which we studied a couple of weeks ago. We uh, looked at the fall of Babylon as the Medes and the Persians uh, took over the city, and of course it was Belshazzar who uh, had thrown this great feast the night that Babylon falls, and um, he is the final king of Babylon. He is slain, of course, following the judgment of the handwriting on the wall. Now, Belshazzar... um, Uh, I'm sorry, Daniel here has waited um, a long time for the vision. Of course, he doesn't know that he's waiting for it, but it's been years, decades, since uh, Nebuchadnezzar had had his vision uh, in Daniel chapter 2. And now it's Daniel's turn to have his dream and his vision. And just as with Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Daniel receives this vision as he is sleeping one night, Of course, the difference is that he remembers the dream, because he says right here in verse 1 that he writes down the dream, and uh, he is explaining the sum of the matters. Uh, Some of the other differences here are that Daniel is immediately given uh, an understanding of this vision. The angel Gabriel comes and um, begins explaining to him, I guess it doesn't say Gabriel here, but Uh, He approaches one of the angels nearby, and the angel begins explaining uh, this dream to Daniel. That, of course, is unlike Nebuchadnezzar, who didn't, first of all, he couldn't remember the dream itself, uh, and then he needed uh, human interpretation to understand it. Daniel is given an interpretation straight from heaven uh, to understand much of this dream. Now let's go on in verse number two. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. Now in Daniel chapter two, Nebuchadnezzar simply sees this statue. It's just kind of there. There's not so much of a setting around it. In Daniel seven, before he even starts seeing these beasts that represent the four empires, he is given a setting. And he is uh, perhaps standing on this, the shore of this great sea here, which uh, a lot of scholars believe may have looked like the Mediterranean, Mediterranean or been the Mediterranean. Um, there's a lot of good reasons uh, to arrive at that conclusion. Uh, of course, the Mediterranean uh, 
see here is geographically the center of where these empires emerged from. But nonetheless, it's a great ocean, a great sea. And Daniel here is looking at um, a really turbulent scene. He says, The four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. Now, one of the important principles of interpreting Bible prophecy is that the Bible interprets itself. And this is such a critical um, and important point to remember. This uh, will, this principle alone will uh, help keep us from many errors in interpreting Bible prophecy. The Bible, uh, or Bible prophecy, contains many symbols, lots of animals, not only in this chapter, but in other chapters, like uh, eagles, there's dragons, and uh, even today we use animals to represent nations. Um, some of those animals change over time, and um, you know, today the dragon would represent China, and this has led many people to look at prophecies in Revelation, where we read about the dragon, and to conclude, oh, well, it's talking about China. Well, there's really no biblical evidence for that. We're simply taking a symbol in the Bible and kind of lifting it off the Bible page and then trying to look at contemporary things in our society or culture or world to help um, interpret that. The the safe and the correct and um, the biblical way of interpreting these symbols is to allow the Bible to interpret it itself. So let's look at a couple of these symbols in Daniel 7 verse 2. The four winds. Uh, The Bible explains what wind can represent in the Bible. In Jeremiah chapter 49, uh, verses 36 and 37, we read this. God says, Upon Elam will I bring the four winds and the four quarters of heaven, and will scatter them towards all those winds, and there shall be no nation whither the outcasts of Elam shall not come. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies, and before them that seek their life. And I will bring evil upon them, even my fierce anger, saith the Lord. And I will send the sword after them, till I have consumed them. And so in these two verses here in Jeremiah 49, we see that the four winds, at least in terms of prophecies that speak of nations coming and going, They really refer to the sword, and this is referring to military combat. And obviously this is how most nations and empires and kingdoms in this world have come and gone. It's through war. And so this is what we're looking at here, Daniel 7, verse 2. The four winds, that is war and conflict, strove upon the great sea. Now here's a second symbol, the water itself. And again, the Bible is clear in a number of passages what um, water, but especially you know turbulent waters of the ocean, what those uh, can represent. And we can turn to Isaiah 57, verse 20, just one of several verses that bring this out. In Isaiah 57, verse 20, we read this, But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. Uh, pretty clear here that the the seas, especially turbulent seas here, um, that are casting up mire and dirt, maybe even being whipped by the wind, making a troubled sea, represents, um, you know, those nations, well, as the Bible puts it, it's the wicked. It's those those nations that have no respect or reverence or knowledge of God, and they are simply trying to, you know, go out and conquer. And so this is what, this is the setting for Daniel chapter 7. And um, this already has given us more information than Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel 2, you simply had the head of gold, Babylon, followed by the chest and arms of silver, uh, the Medes and the Persians. And, of course, we know from history that there were great battles that were fought in the succession of these empires. But in prophecy, now we see that brought out in Daniel 7. So there's more information being given this second time through. Now, in Daniel 7, verse 3, Uh, Here comes to view uh, the beasts. And the four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. And now again, let's just let the Bible interpret what beasts represent. A little bit later in the chapter, in verse 17, the angel who is speaking to Daniel says this, These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. And so we're looking at 
king's political powers that are coming about uh, because of the fighting among nations. A few verses later in uh, Daniel 7 verse 23, it's even brought out more clearly that these are not individual kings necessarily, but the kingdoms that they represent. Verse 23 reads like this. Uh, Thus he said, the fourth, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down, and break it in pieces. So the, here it's very clearly, clearly brought out that we're looking at kingdoms rather than individual kings. This is important as we, um, looking ahead, we're not going to cover this today, but in many ways the... Um, the most important uh, prophetic figure here in Daniel 7, um, other than the judgment that takes place in heaven, is the little horn power. There's been a lot of different interpretations and uh, confusion as to who the little horn represents. Many people believe it points to one specific king, Antiochus Epiphanes, um, who lived well before the time of Christ. Well, it's clear from the prophecy that... um, these beasts and their horns represent not so much individual kings, but kingdoms. And so again, allowing the Bible to interpret itself can um, keep us from misinterpreting uh, these important prophecies in the Bible. And now at this point, the first beast emerges. In verse 4, Daniel sees um, a lion that had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And this, of course, is a parallel with the head of gold. This is the kingdom of Babylon. And um, the lion is a fitting symbol. In fact, uh, we know that a symbol that the Babylonians themselves used to represent their empire was a lion with wings. And so Daniel would have known instantly what this symbol pointed to. In the next verse, he sees a bear rising up, Uh, It had uh, on one side, leaning more heavily on one foot. This is the Medes and the Persians. And um, the leaning on one side indicates that it was the Persians that would eventually become the dominant um, power among those two. This is why today we speak of Persian rugs and not Median rugs, or the Persian Gulf and not the the Median Gulf. In Daniel 7, verse 6, here he sees the leopard, which corresponds to to the belly and thighs of brass in Daniel chapter 2. This is um, the Grecian Empire, and it has four wings on its back, indicating the speed with which it would do its uh, conquering. And that, of course, points pretty clearly to Alexander the Great, who conquered the known world by his early 30s. And um, the four heads represent the division of the empire following Alexander's death, and his four generals split up that empire, of course, through fighting as well. And then in Daniel chapter 7 comes the fourth beast, the great and dreadful beast with iron, corresponding to the iron legs in Daniel chapter 2. It is the most destructive of the four. It devours, it breaks in pieces, it stamps the residue with its feet, and it's different from all the beasts before it, and it has ten horns. Um, We will zero in on one of those horns tomorrow as we look at the little horn, but this, of course, points to the Roman power, and um, uh, its uh, its unique uh, power over the earth for uh, centuries, which lasted much longer than any of the empires before it. So it is diverse and different in that and many other ways. Well, we are out of time today. I thank you for joining us. I hope that you've been blessed. By the time spent in God's Word, just a reminder, you can go to our website and uh, find our weekly study guides and teacher helps, and we hope that those will be of benefit to you. Thank you for joining us, and please tune in again tomorrow. Deeper is a production of Pathway to Paradise Ministries. For more Bible study resources, including books, DVDs, and study guides, visit pathwaytoparadise.org or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. To support this ministry with your tax-deductible contribution, visit pathwaytoparadise.org or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. That's 855-447-8788.